Our subject for tonight, how much can one man take? How much can one man take? Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Salamat Sabbath. I am very pleased and honored to be with you. I have been all week. It's now 10 minutes to 8. Let us try to make full use of the time God has given to us. So I'll ask you now to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus, the only name through which I can come to you. And I ask you, Father, to have mercy upon me as I prepare to deliver the words of life to your listening people. Father, put your words in my mouth. Put your ideas in my mind. And speak through me. Open the minds and the hearts of those who are listening. That they may not simply hear. But heed the words that you deliver. Through your manservant. So that we may all leave this place with a renewed determination. To serve you with all our hearts. Even as you give Jesus with all your heart. We pray in his name. Amen. Our subject for tonight how much can one man take how much can one man take we welcome those who are coming in god bless you come right in come right in go with me to job chapter 1 we shall begin reading at verse 6 job chapter 1 reading from verse 6 our subject tonight how much can one man take? Do you have Job? What can you tell me about Job? What can you tell me? He was faithful. What else can you tell me about the book of Job? Let's say that again. It was written by Moses, we believe. We also believe it is the oldest book of the Bible. I did not say the book that records the oldest events, not as Genesis. But it is the oldest book of the Bible. This is Brother Job. Verse 6 of chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thy hand and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now this incident in the life of Job gives to us an insight that Job did not have. Poor Job, as we sometimes say, he had no clue whatsoever that the calamities that befell him were part of a larger picture, a cosmic picture. It was part of the tremendous battle between Satan and Christ. What Seventh-day Adventists refer to as what? The great controversy and all that has happened on this earth in its history has merely been an expression and outworking of this great controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. The Bible says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Now God does not run a one man show. When God made Adam and Eve, the Bible says he gave them dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God shares with us administration 
and dominion. He has ownership. He gives us dominion. Work with me. God has always desired that he would cooperate with us and that we would cooperate with him. And so the sons of God from wherever they were in the universe, apparently they would come and meet with God regularly. Because in chapter 2 verse 1, we have the meeting with God again. And so the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord to give God an account of what was going on in the universe. The Bible says, and Satan came also among them. Which means that at some point in history, Satan had access to heaven. So he came, obviously, representing this earth. Because when Adam sinned, Satan became the God of this earth. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 19, Of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. The person who overcomes you is the person who controls you. And so Satan came as the representative of this earth. So when Satan showed up, God said to him, Whence comest thou? Now God knew, but God has this habit, even though he knows everything, he likes us to speak up. Remember Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, when God came down into the garden, he said, Adam, where art thou? Did God know where he was? Yes. God wasn't asking behind what tree are you hiding. God wants Adam to admit and confess where he was spiritually. Where are thou? When he spoke to Eve, he said, what hast thou done? Well, God knew what she had done. But God wants us to confess and admit this is the first step towards spiritual healing. When Cain killed Abel, God said to Cain, what has thou, where is thy brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know. So God said to Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, and what the devil said is frightening. He said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now he did not say from going to and fro in the universe because he was restricted. From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now why was he going to and fro and walking up and down seeking whom he may devour? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about. 1 Peter 5, 8, seeking whom he may devour. In that sense, the devil was true to his behavior. Then God said something. God seems to be saying, all right, if you have been walking up and down in the earth, if you have been going to and fro, then you must have met a man called Job. In all your travels up and down the earth, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth. Let's pause on that statement from God. How would you feel if you knew that that is how God describes you? There is none like him in the earth. Now it's not enough to know that's how God describes me. I also need to know, is he saying that because of how good I am or how bad I am? There is none like, because it applies on both sides. But of course, in the case of Job, our brother, God was bragging. And God is the only being in the universe with a right to brag. Come on, say amen. And God said, hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth? Not just in Mesopotamia, not just in Corona. Not just in Loma Linda, there is no other human being on the face of the earth, spiritually, like this man Job. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now this is God speaking. This is not God reading from Job's resume. You know how we write resumes? We sound as though we are saints. We know everything about the job. We've had vast experience. We know how to polish a resume. God was not reading from Job's resume. God was reading from his own resume about Job. He is a perfect and an upright man. One that fears God and 
escheweth evil. What does escheweth mean? He avoids. Many times as Christians we get into trouble because we don't avoid sin. We walk up to sin as though we're bad. Then we're tempted and we fall. It is better never to have to deal with the temptation. So we avoid sin. God says one of the things he liked about Job, Job would avoid sin. When it's one o'clock in the morning, you're still at that woman's house giving a Bible study. What else are you doing? You're asking for trouble. When you're hanging out with people who drink and smoke and cuss and do drugs, what are you doing? You are not avoiding evil. When you work constantly to the very edges of God's holy Sabbath day, what are you doing? We are not avoiding evil. We must have an aversion to evil that we deal with it even before we are tempted. I avoid any circumstance that may bring upon me a temptation. And God said, I like this man for four reasons. He's perfect. He's upright. He fears me. And he avoids evil. I call upon all of us, me first, then you. Let us make it a habit to avoid evil. Can you say amen? amen. Let's avoid it like the plague. Well, Satan couldn't just let God brag. Satan said, Doth Job fear God for naught? This is verse 9. Job asked, Satan asked God a question. Do you think that Job serves you for nothing? Job serves you, the implication is, because there is something in it for him. Job serves you not because he loves you for who you are. Job serves you because of what he gets from you. That's the charge. Meaning that there is no way that Job would serve you if you did not give him all these things. If you did not bribe him. And a bribe is a sort of coercion. Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him? And about his house? And about all that he hath on every side? Even in the devil's accusation, we see the goodness of God. When we serve God, when we fear God, when we avoid evil, God puts a hedge about us. Come on, what do you say? Amen. And about our house, what do you say? And about all that we have on every side, God loves to put a hedge around his people. Amen. There's nothing wrong with God putting a hedge around us. This is what a father does for his child. To protect the child, the devil was right. God put a hedge. Is there the hedge of God around your life? Is the hedge of God around your children? Is the hedge of God around your family? Satan realized that God had a hedge about Job. Satan knew this is a difficult man to tempt. Because when God puts a hedge around you, no one can break through that hedge. Come on. Is there a hedge about us? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Then Satan challenged God. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath. Material things. And he will curse thee to thy face. Now, when, Job, when this devil said that, remember all the sons of God were sitting there listening. This accusation against God was not made just between God and Satan privately in some remote corner of the universe. It was made publicly in the presence of all the sons of God representing all areas of the universe where people live. Because this world is not the only place where there's life. Well, what's God to do? He is publicly accused of wrongdoing. Bible says, and God said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. Now, God allows the devil to play and tamper with Job's possessions. Now, you know how attached we are to our possessions. Am I right? 
We love our shoes. We love our designer handbags. We love our cars. We love our trucks. We love our houses. We love our bangles. We love our beads. We love our... We love them. And they love us back by enslaving us, you see. Remember Lot's wife? She loved her possessions so much she could not leave that city. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White writes, when Lot's wife was told to leave, she thought it was unfair of God to ask her to leave her possessions that she had taken so long to accumulate. The devil told God, you touch his possessions and you will see that his love for you goes no further than the things you give him. God said, go ahead. There was no hesitation on the part of God because God knew Job. God said, go ahead and we're talking about how much can one man take. Now, let's go down to verse 13 of Job chapter 1. It's five minutes after eight. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Calamity number one. The devil wastes no time once he has some access to you and to me. He wastes no time. Immediately he went forth from the presence of the Lord and he launched his attack against Job. The oxen were plowing. And the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell the next verse. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. And I've burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell the calamity number two. In the same day, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Calamity number three, same day. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Job must have said, Why is there always one person escaping to bring bad news? How much can one man take? In one day. The Bible says in verse 20. Then Job fell upon the ground. Then Job rose. Rent his mantle. Fell upon the ground. And worshipped. Say amen. amen. Do you think it's easy to worship God when everything is going wrong? Our first inclination is to blame God. You could have stopped it. Why didn't you stop it? The Bible says, when Job bowed down and weighed down with these four successive calamities, the loss of all his oxen and all his asses, the loss of all his servants and all his sheep, the loss of all his camels with the servants except one, the loss of all his children and their servants except one, the Bible says Job stood up, tore his clothes as a sign of grief, shaved his head, fell on his face, and worshipped God. Now, let me tell you this. The only way a man or a woman can do this is if God is their highest priority. Some people believe that in a moment of grief, it is okay to lose control. It is never okay to lose control. If any man had a reason to lose control, it was Job. But with every catastrophe brought to him, Job held on to his consciousness. God is, I can hear Job when he was told calamity number one. All the oxen and sheep are destroyed and the asses. God is good. God is good. The next calamity came. God is good. The third calamity came. 
God is good. The fourth calamity came. God is good as he fell to the ground. God is still good. Whether you're standing or you're collapsing with grief. God must be good. The Bible says, and said, verse 21, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. <laughs> Say amen for that. Amen. How many of you came out of your womb with some material possession? How many of us? Hmm? Why is it you gather so many things to take back? There is no place to take them back. You came out one way, we go back to the grave the same way. Job teaches us a lesson. When we think like this, then what we have ceased to be a form of slavery. That's why at the end of Job's life, God doubled everything he had. Because Job understood, look, God can take these things any time he chooses. Because really, they're not mine. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And verse 22 tells us, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Have you ever been angry with God because something happened to you? You broke a nail just before banquet. Can't find your keys. Your child did not come first in his or her class. He just came second and there's a calamity in the home. And the easiest target for our anger is God. Because God is so good, he just sits there and takes it. He just takes it. And it is in the human nature to let someone have it who will just sit there and take it. So we let God have it and he takes it until we collapse with exhaustion from giving it to him. Then he can talk to us. Not Job. How much can one man take? The Bible says in verse 22 of Job chapter 1, in all this. How much was that? All of this. What's the worst you've ever gone through? Don't tell me. Just the, what is the worst you've ever you failed an exam? Were you suicidal? That's not funny. Do you know there's students every year who kill themselves because they fail exams? Jump off buildings, overdose, because they had some goal in mind. Failed an exam. The goal is gone. Kill themselves. In all this, how much can one man or woman take? How far would you have gone if you were Job? After the first report of a calamity, would you still be on your feet? I don't know about me. Of course, I like to think I would. That's the way we are. But I thank God for Job's example. In all of this, Job sinned not. Listen to me. There is no excuse for sin. If ever a man had a reason to say one evil word to God, just for five seconds, to get it out of his system, Job had that excuse. The Bible says, in all this, too many Christians are quick to find a reason to lose it. Run into the back of my car and I lose it for ten minutes. Don't lose it. Hold on to it. Because you will never go through and I can never expect to experience what Job went through. And in his experience, the Bible says in all of this, not some of it, or most in all of it, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. First round goes to God, the devil loses. He told God, take away all that he hath. He will curse thee to thy face. Job did not curse God to his face. Did the devil give up? Oh no. Chapter 2 verse 1. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Here is God having one of his regular meetings. And Satan pops up again. Now we don't know how much time elapsed between the first meeting of verse 6 of chapter 1. And the second meeting of verse 1 of chapter 2. We don't know how much time. Might have been 10 years, might have been, we don't know. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? 
Was that a question God asked him the first time? Yes. Listen to Satan's response. And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Was that what he said the first time? What does that tell you about the devil? What does it tell you about him? He's consistent. His mission did not change. He could have said, well, I was a little tired walking up and down, so I sat down by a beach for six years and I took a break. Uh -uh. I am doing the same thing. I am going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down, looking for your people to destroy. The devil does not slumber nor sleep. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Now, Job is in a different set of circumstances. Job has no children, all ten killed in one day. That was calamity number four. He has no livestock, which represented riches, which is still the case in some cultures around the world. The Maasai is East Africa, they count their wealth in cattle. All of that, God, all his asses, all his sheep, most of his servants, all his camels, all the oxen, everything gone. All Job had left was his life, his skin, and his wife. God said, hast thou considered my servant Job? That there's none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and eschewth evil. Now let's pause. Was that the same description God gave in verse 8 of chapter 1? Yes. Now did Job have a human reason to start acting up? Yes. But with the passing of time, when he lost everything, to this second meeting of God's sons, Job had not changed. He was still perfect. He was still upright. He was still a man who feared evil and a man who was faithful to God, eschewed evil and feared God. The loss of all his possessions did not change Job's relationship to God. Why? Why? Because his relationship with God was number one to him, not what he had. What we have come and go. Our relationship with God must remain untouched, untainted by the calamities of this life. And so God says, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil. The verse goes on to say, verse 3, and still, beautiful expression, he holdeth fast. His integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him, how? Now let's pause on without a cause. Without a cause was one title I considered for the message. Now this is God speaking. Think. God is telling Satan, I have no cause to destroy this man. You ought to say amen. amen. Do you know what God is saying about Job? What's the only cause God has to destroy a man? Sin. What's the only cause God has to destroy a woman? Sin. What's the only reason why God punished the Israelites, sent them into captivity time and time again? One reason, what is that? Sin. God said, you are trying to get me to destroy a man and I have no cause. Oh, that God could say that about me. I have no cause to destroy Randy Ski. May I ask you a question? Don't answer me. As you sit where you sit and I stand where I stand, does God have any cause to destroy us? If your quiet, private, personal answer is yes, before you walk out that door, the answer should be no. By confession and repentance. I ask again, does God have cause tonight to destroy us? And the only thing that can serve as a cause is sin. And God said his voice must have echoed through the universe to destroy him without a cause. 
I love the expression, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. We have to learn to hold fast. I don't mean to make the gospel undignified, but I bless come. Cameraman, I'm moving, whoever he is. Come, come. We're talking about hold fast his integrity. All right? Now, bless, let's be dignified on the Sabbath. I'm holding on to this. Put your arms around my shoulder, around my waist. Mm -hmm. Now, pull me away from this thing. Pull me away. Okay, he pulled me away. Was I holding fast? No, all right. Now, bless, pull me from this thing. Pull me, pull me. Pull, bless, pull, bless. You're vegetarian, bless, pull. Can do it. I am holding fast. My integrity, are you following me? We must learn to hold on to God no matter how fiercely the winds blow. Too many Christians, all we do is we hold on to God with these two things. And the devil comes by and pulls us away. We must learn to hold fast. And God said, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Which means that Job's integrity integrity was more important to him than all his possessions. What does the Bible say about a good name? A good name is to be had more than riches, more than gold. There's a saying, he that taketh my purse, taketh nothing. He that taketh my name, taketh everything. Still, he holdeth fast his integrity. There's a young man on the job trying to seduce you. Are you holding fast your integrity? There's someone in the business world trying to get you to do something dishonest. Are you holding fast your integrity? There's someone bribing me with money to soften up the gospel. Am I holding fast my integrity? We have to learn to hold fast and not let go. Even if holding fast means we die. God said still. He holdeth fast his integrity. The devil says, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. Now the devil goes from material possessions. Then he cranks up the pressure. Touch his health. The Lord said unto Satan, behold he's in thine hand, but save his life. When God told Satan... You can touch his possessions. God said, don't touch him. When God told Satan, you can touch him, God said, don't touch his life. In all this calamity, we see God under control. Let me give you a word of assurance. The devil can only do to you what God allows him to do. Now, when I say do to you, I accept you as God's children. If you're not a child of God... <laughs> The devil has greater freedom to do with you whatever he wants. I am talking about the children of God. God restricts the, 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 the behavior of Satan in the life of his people. And so God said, behold all that he hath, behold he's in thy hand, but save his life. So when Satan falls from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot, Unto his crown. Verse 8 of Job chapter 2. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. Now Job the devil comes. And he takes Job's health. How many people have cursed God on a sick bed? How many people have cursed God seconds before their last breath was breathed? Job now was on the verge of dying. He was covered with a loathsome disease, the Bible says, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, when you cover from the sole of your foot, you can't walk unless you love pain. You're trying to get off your feet. But the boils are all over where you sit. You can't lean, the boys are over. Job was in agony. In agony. Let's look at verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, 
Dost thou still retain thine integrity? My beloved brothers and sisters, we must have a faithfulness to God that shocks and surprises those close to us. The wife could not believe that this man was still, for, even though she had known Job all her life, she had seen her husband, a faithful man. She had never seen him driven to this extent. She had never seen his faith tested to this limit, and she was shocked. We are living in the last days, and God is trying to perfect a people whose faithfulness to him will shock people. Man, these people are so faithful. People will stop what they're doing and stare at God's people as if they were in a museum of Christian morality. Do you still, after all of this, she said to him, curse God and die. What else is there to do when you curse God? Curse him and die. Verse 10, but Job said unto her, thou speaketh as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hands of God and shall we not receive evil? Now read the last part of that verse for me. In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Even though things got worse. Not one word of complaint against God came out of Job's lips. I'm not preaching about Job so we can admire Job. Whatever God accomplished through one human being, he can accomplish through another. God has Job's right here now listening to me. Because we're not far from the end of the history of this world. We as a church believe it. I hope we as individuals believe it. God needs Job's in these last days. Who will be faithful to him no matter what. You will not put a job ahead of God. You will not put a man ahead of God or a woman ahead of God. God is first in all things and at all times. This is what God wants in us. In these last days, a people who prefer to die than to dishonor God. Job, sit in the ashes, and he sat there. His friends came, sat with him, did not speak for a week. The last verse of chapter 2. And none spake a word unto him because they saw that his grief was what? Very great. There is a tendency in us to make allowances for people who are grieving. Now, I don't want to come across as harsh. I have grieved. But I'm saying what I said earlier. If anyone deserved a little slack in a moment of grief, it was Job. And in all his grief, Job never lost control. He never lost the consciousness that God is first. God is first. And in all that happens to me, I must praise him, represent him, give him glory. And I'm saying God requires this of us today. In Daniel chapter 3. Reading from verse 16, our scripture reading for this evening, and we're close to the end of the message. The Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O king Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to de deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, and I love those three words, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We must learn to serve God for no other reason than because of who God is. Did you hear me? Those three boys said, look, we know God can deliver us. We serve him. But even if he does not deliver us, it will not change our decision. We are not bowing. We are ready to die. Job was ready to die. Paul was ready to die. Joseph was ready to die. Daniel was ready to die. Jesus was ready to die. And they die. What are we ready to do? Do you not understand 
that every Christian must come to the place where he or she comes face to face with his or her Gethsemane. And you feel as if you're sweating great drops of blood. And God is in heaven perhaps biting his divine nails, hoping we don't turn back and disgrace him. Because of Job's faithfulness, God triumphed over the enemy. Let me tell you this. The lives we live either bring credit to God or credit to the devil. We just have a choice to make. Whom will I make look good in the way I live my life? In the way I spend my money, who is glorified? God or the devil? Listen to me. There is not a third choice. Yeah, I was telling my friend out of Wycliffe today, or he told me actually, or yesterday, for God, you either right or wrong. <laughs> now, you know, what's so difficult about that? You're either right or wrong. You're either with God or with Satan. In the life of Job, we saw God, we saw Satan, Job had a choice. There was no middle ground, there never is, there never has been in the cosmos. It's God or Satan, Christ or the devil, the great controversy, good and evil. And all God ever asks us to do is to take up opposition with the one who represents all good, and that is Jesus Christ. But if you don't know the love of God, then you cannot be faithful to God as Job was. Because the power that keeps us faithful is our belief that God deserves. You parents can understand what I'm about to say. You work two jobs, three jobs, why? To put your children through school, why? Because you believe they deserve that. And so we work, and we work, and we work our fingers to the bone, and we wash clothes, and we wash floors, and we do the why. I want my son to go to school. He deserves it. I want a better life for him. What does God deserve? God deserves my blood. God deserves me being faithful. God deserves me being willing to die just to make him look good. God deserves that. And God deserves to have me say, no matter what the devil does to me in all this, I will not sin against God. God deserves that kind of commitment. If you agree, say amen. I tell you, God deserves it. Because he is God. He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. And what God did in Job's life, God can do for you and for me. Listen, God has very few people on whom he can depend. Very few. Every country has armies. Very few armies have most of the soldiers as heroes. Heroes are a very small group of people. Because what it takes to be a hero is not found in most people. Job is a hero. Daniel is a hero. Heroes can take it. The hero is the man who runs into a burning building, oblivious of his own safety to save someone else. When we live an upright life, we run into a burning building to save God's reputation. Are there any heroes here tonight? What God wants is for you to come to him and say, Lord, I am no Job tonight. But I want to put my foot on the path to being faithful to you, no matter what. I want you to be able to trust me to represent you. And so I say to God, my personal commitment, Father, give me the power to represent you, to stand for you wherever I go, even if it means loss of life. Give me the spiritual courage to stand up for you. And die knowing that I have glorified your name. How many of you will say, Lord, this is a little nerve-wracking. But please, please put into my heart a desire to serve you above everything else and everyone else. If you can say that, can I see your right hand? God bless you. Could you stand up, please? You're standing to say, Father, put into my heart a desire to serve you above everyone else and above everything else. Put that into my heart. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
I come to you tonight at the end of this message. How much can one man take? Father, we've looked at the life of Job. We've seen that the, regardless of the calamities brought upon him by the devil with your permission, Job remained faithful by your own testimony. You said still he holds fast his integrity. His wife, against her will, testified to his faithfulness when she said, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Oh, Father, help us so live that people who see us will marvel at our determination to serve you, to do what's right under all circumstances. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, give us a love for you that is greater than the fear of death and save us when you come. I pray from my heart, in Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen. And amen, you may be seated.